Hi and welcome to the breadboard. Uh, this is actually take two of a mailbag episode. Uh, in take one I realized at the end that I had neglected to turn on my microphone and its little uh, battery adapter so I had the choice of either redoing the video or trying to dub the voice back over the video um, in post editing and as it was going to take pretty much as long to do that if not longer and you'd probably see some lip syncing issues along the way um, I decided that I would re-record this. So some of the things that were going to be getting opened out of the mailbag box bags they're already out of the bags because uh, well I did that the first time around. So spent a lot of time over the last few weeks doing my CNC projects and some of you have been a little concerned that I'm ditching the analog and power supply projects and things like that. I'm not. Um, it's just that I live in Canada in uh, Ontario and we're diving into winter right now so I've just been trying to get some of the CNC parts built up um, which is to be done outside my garage and it's been rapidly getting cold out there going to below zero. What you see behind me here is a whole bunch of mail that has been arriving over the last few weeks that I have yet to do some uh, videos or start using so I figured I would just quickly show you what's up and coming uh, whet your appetite a little bit in some areas and um, you can provide some feedback on anything you might want to particularly see on any of the parts as we go through it. So if I start at the very end over here, um, one of the things that um, somebody in my position is able to do is get sample chips from uh, Atmel, Texas Instruments and other companies and so I've been trying to get a few of the newer ones that Texas Instruments have been coming out with recently and also some that are related to some of the power supply projects and um, Arduino control like microcontroller kind of stuff that we've been doing over the last little while to try and show you how to achieve um, things like isolating your controller from the power side, um, driving power loads from little signals, um, you know, a bit more on analog to digital, digital conversion so that we can drive the power supply project from a microcontroller but have the I2C bus in, uh, isolated and things. Um, Texas Instruments also have some other cool chips that will do um, lux intensity meters, humidity sensing and things like that as well as some new temperature sensors. So I've got a whole bunch of different chips now from them and um, I've got a box full here and I thought I'd just have a very very quick run through. Nothing in detail, just basically give you a little taste of what I've got in here that I'm going to be doing some videos on in the next little while. Now if you provide some feedback and tell me what you might want to see first as long as you're not everybody you know saying something different then I'll give some priority to some of them. Starting um, with the power supply project one of the things we've talked about in that uh, series is isolating your control system from the power side of things and there's, there's a number of different ways to achieve that and one of the things that Agilent, you know, previously HP have done it and I've looked at power supply designs from way way back is they actually used an optical isolator, the basic kind that you would use for um, isolating a digital signal maybe to drive a power transistor for a switch or something or to isolate a signal coming into your microcontroller but still using it as either on or off. Um, but you can actually get some specialized uh, opto isolators that can be used in an analog manner to provide an analog opto isolation between um, the LED side and the transistor side and what I've got is two versions of this. I had to buy these ones because they're not available as a sample and they're quite expensive. So they're made by Vichy and they are IL300-F series and, and what these do is they have one LED but instead of having one transistor or a Darlington transistor for the output to go with that LED and some of those you can get in quad packages and dual and things like that um, these have two transistors that are completely isolated from each other and one LED and the idea is that you use one of the transistors as part of the feedback into your driver side so if you've got an op amp say um, driving a power transistor and things like that you can feed it through one of the LEDs uh, through the LED and drive the transistor and that can be part of your feedback loop and then the other transistor because they're made to be matched pairs can use, be used to drive your um, through an op amp and things as part of a loop 
to create an isolated version of the signal that is a very accurate representation of the one on the power side. Um, some of the other things that I managed to get, these are OPA 2192s, they're uh, dual like, op amps uh, to use for testing. I got a few things in here, so I'm just going to go through them. I've got a some HDC 1050 uh, DMBT, so HTC 1050 humidity sensors from Texas Instruments. So we'll have a look at that. These are going to be really cool for hooking up to Arduinos and things. Um, switch capacity voltage converter. Right? One of the things we've talked about for the power supply project when you're driving high side FETs and things like that is how do you get your high side voltage? And we had a little bit of an experiment with a um, capacitor and some diodes and things to try and drive up the voltage but it wasn't really very successful in my opinion and I, I felt at the time it was easier to use a, uh, a separate little you know plus or minus 12 volt supply or something like that to drive the op amp and sit it on the rail um, of the power rail. Now I still would like to sit it on the power rail but I want to go back and revisit how we can drive uh, derive those additional voltages and this little device from Texas Instruments what it is is it's a switch capacitor and by using some analog switches that provide some isolation it uses like a, almost like a bucket brigade is the best way I can describe it where you fill up a capacitor on one side with a charge and then you switch both legs of that capacitor to the other side so you disconnect it from the first and you transfer that charge to the other side of a switch which is then connected to a positive level. So you effectively fill it up here and then you kind of like chuck it up the hill. Think of salmon, salmon swimming up um, a waterfall. So you're taking that little bit of energy lower down and you're slowly bringing it up and up and up. And what these things do is allow you to take say five volts and by charging that capacitor up between the zero and five volt rail, um, and then switching the two pins of the capacitor to the 5 volt plus being the 0 volt on the capacitor and then something else, you can actually get about 10 volts out. Now you can't do a lot of current with this, but it could be enough to drive a FET for a high side drive or something like that, or just providing a small additional rail from say a 9 volt battery, you could maybe generate a plus and minus 9 volt supply for a little op amp for a piece of instrumentation that you want to have battery operated, but without having to go to uh, having two batteries or something. So that would be interesting to have a look at. ALM2402, this is an IC op amp dual HV. Uh, I think that's a high voltage op amp that we're gonna have a look at. Um, I won't go into too much details of that. I'm just trying to highlight the interesting ones. Oh, here we go, OPT300. This is an uh, ambient light sensor from Texas Instruments. So we're gonna have a look at that. If I, the one thing I've got with this though is I've gotta find some kind of breakout board for it because it's a surface mount and I don't currently have a breakout. So I've got a few on order. Hopefully they'll be here soon. And as soon as I can, I'll uh, hook it up and we'll play with it. Either that or I'll try and very carefully solder some wires directly onto this thing. Anyway, a fairly accurate um, ambient light sensor from TI. We have a uh, temperature sensor, one of the new TMP107s. In the past, I've played with 102 temperature sensors, which is your basic jelly bean TI uh, one wire or you know, like I2C kind of, I can't remember if it's one wire or I2C. Anyway, temperature sensor. This one is the newer 107 uh, temperature sensor from TI. So we're gonna have a look at that. And we'll look at how to hook it up to a Raspberry Pi, an Arduino, and maybe a launch pad. Um, number of different uh, analog to digital converters. There's two varieties I've got here. These are 32-bit analog to digital converters. So, you know, a really massive range, you know, 32 bits of resolution is huge. Uh, and these have also got programmable gain amplifiers on the input. So whilst most of the circuits that I would be able to build here without some special PCB designs and things like that would never resolve a full 32 bits of uh, ADC accuracy and you'd need some very high-end um, voltage references to go with this if you wanted to be able to rely on it. Um, you certainly can build some very interesting instrumentation kind of measurement circuitries, either with Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or something else, using precision amplifiers like this. Because over a short period of time, they will be reasonably stable, even if they're not terribly accurate. So you might be able to rely on accuracy to maybe, you know, uh, 16 to 20 bits, and certainly not the 32 bits, but you'll have a resolution that goes much, much higher than that. So any short-term uh, variances you'd be able to see. Now, by using the um, programmable gain 
amplifiers and things like that too. You could hook these things up to strain gauges and various other things. And because of the very, very wide dynamic range that these ADCs will have, um, it should be capable of doing some quite interesting measurements over quite a wide range of input voltages. Ah, this one's a good one for the power supply project. What this is, these are tiny little chips, is an INA250A2. It's a 15 amp current monitor. Um, the, the nice thing about these things is they're a tiny little surface mount chip, um, 8 pin or something like that, but the shunt resistor, the precision shunt resistor for measuring the current is built into the chip. And these are capable, this, this particular ones I have have got here, of measuring 15 amps. And the output from the amplifier um, comes out at 500 millivolts per amp. And you can use these for high side and low side. So that'll be really good to look at as far as current sensing for the uh, power supply project as an alternative way of doing it. Of course, our design currently still has a very good way of doing that, but I wanted to look at some alternatives that you could use that might simplify um, a board layout or something like that. Oh, another one. Hi, uh, I see this is a TPS1H100B. It's a load switch high side. Now, anybody that's designing uh, PLCs or want to have um, up to 24 volt um, high side driven outputs from an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or something like that. You have to go to a bunch of uh, through a bunch of um, semi complex circuitry to be able to achieve that. And what these devices do is they're an all in one solution that are designed for use with programmable logic controllers and stuff like that, where you can feed them with low level TTL logic, either 3.3 volts or 5 volts into the chip, but they have a high um, high side output. So you're actually pushing from 24 volt supply out to the device that you're trying to control. Anyway, enough of that. We'll uh, deal with more of that when we get to it. 36 volt zero drift rail to rail op amps. So one of the things we were looking at with the power supply project is different op amps that you can use on high side and low side. And some of the ones that you may be able to use by having them tied to the zero volt. So in a simpler circuit, you may not want to sit your control so, uh, system floating on the raw power of the uh, main power supply um, power. <laughs> So if you are in that situation and Martin Lawton is doing a student power supply project which falls into that category where his main control system is actually uh, being driven for its supply from the same power that is being used to drive the output. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it means that you, you know, if you want to have something more than 30 volts, say, as your output from your power supply, it means you have to have op amps and things that are able to have a supply rail that goes beyond that. And that's where you start getting into more expensive op amps and things. So I've got one or two here that we can have a look at. Yeah, I think that's about it now, right now for all of the chips. So you can see quite a range of chips that are here to look at over the next um, few weeks and over the Christmas holiday. I've also got um, some stepper motor controllers. I've had a couple of people asking me about using an Arduino to drive a stepper motor, and there is a number of different ways to do it. And I'm not just going to tie it to the Arduino either. When I go through the video to do this, I'm going to look at using a Raspberry Pi. I'm going to look at using a launch pad and an Arduino or a variant of Arduinos as well. And you know, right from the very basics, you can have digital outputs from your controller driving some uh, discrete transistors and then they drive a motor um, to turn it on or off. And then if you want to change directions, you start having to talk about things like H-bridge uh, drivers, which involves four transistors, which allows you to say forward and reverse direction of a single motor or um, using two full H-bridge circuits, you can drive a stepper motor. Um, and so I'm going to take you through driving individual DC motors, solenoids, um, and then move through within a video up to driving stepper motors using, first of all, a, a discrete H-bridge um, driver, and then moving on from that to use a full um, controller where you can actually specify the current and just simply drive it with step and direction. So your microcontroller doesn't have to get into um, the phases of a stepper motor or anything like that. So I've got those chips coming from TI right now. They haven't arrived yet. I think they're probably going to arrive tomorrow or the day after. They're usually pretty good at sending them. And um, I think it coincides nicely that they've 
become available to me from TI and the fact that I'm getting a few people asking about them on the forums for various projects they're trying to do. One of the ones that I've seen somebody try to do is a laser harp uh, where they want to oscillate a stepper motor to drive a mirror so that they get these, uh, I don't think you've ever seen one on YouTube or somewhere else, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, um, a French musician, has some awesome laser harps and things in his concerts. So I actually am thinking about doing a project where we will actually build a laser harp um, and use a step motor and things like that to control it. So the next thing in the mailbag that has arrived, and this one is something that actually is on Indiegogo, or some of this is on Indiegogo, is I have a bunch of products here from a company called IT Studio. They have their own website, and what they've got is um, a couple of projects that they put on Indiegogo right now for uh, crowdfunding. And I got them to play with because one of the things I'm very interested in doing, and uh, if you're lo listening from Element 14, you've been on the forums for a while, you'll know that some of us top members like myself and Mark and a few others, um, if we see something that's driving mains that is unsafe, we will um, jump all over it and make sure that the, at minimum there are a whole bunch of health warnings plastered into the post and at best depending on what the um, member is trying to portray we'll get the videos or the circuits actually pulled from the site because they're unsafe and because we've got people that are um, everything from a newbie uh, amateur or young child building systems up to you know older people or more experienced people but still don't necessarily have experience with mains. We wanna make sure that you're doing it safely as possible. So IT Studio, um, I saw a link that came through my email um, about some of the new products they were doing. And on their um, Indiegogo uh, campaign right now, they have two products. And I've, they've got, I've got more in this bag, but um, one of the brack brackets is off here. They have a mains controller, which is basically um, this one. And what you've got, there's another bracket in the box, like this green one that goes, screws over here that completely encapsulates it. So this looks like one of those things you get for like a light starter or something like that for a fluorescent tube. Um, so you can screw it down to some nice secure location. You've got mains comes in one side and then you've got your load come out the other side. And that's the only connectivity. And these have got nice cable clamping and things like that. We'll do a whole video on it very, very shortly. Um, but they can this thing can drive up to 10 amp load. But the nice thing is that it has two radios built in there. There's a little microcontroller in here and it's got a Wi-Fi, uh, I think it's using the ES266 controllers in here. And it's also got a 433 megahertz wireless radio as well. So it can actually, you can use a smartphone, um, an odd, you know, um, either Android or iOS or some other Wi-Fi connected device to talk to the controller in here to turn the lights on and off. Or you can use a, I've got one down here somewhere, here we go, a little key fob that they also sent me and it has a little slidey door on it with buttons. And this is, um, will transmit on the 433 megahertz um, radio frequency to also talk to these to turn things on and off as well, which is really cool. Now, the other nice thing I want to have a look at is how I can drive these uh, if, if possible. Because it's using the ESP266 Wi-Fi, I should be able to use something like an Arduino or something else to talk to these as well. Um, but these are, because of the nature of the way these are built, and we'll look at how they're built internally as well, um, they should be very safe to use. And um, because, you know, you can't get it, and there's no mains, it's effectively double insulated. These are samples that I got from them, so they don't have um, any certification labels or anything like that on them yet. And as I said, this is currently going through the Indiegogo crowdfunding, but I will rip these apart. We'll have a look what's inside them. Um, even this one, sorry, I've, I've talked about this one, which does a 10 amp load. This one is a light fitting uh, adapter. You, what you do is you take your light out. This one is for North America where you have the screw fitting and you screw this into the light fitting and then you screw your bulb in the bottom. And this is also very, very similar to this in that it's got a Wi-Fi and a 433 megahertz radio in here with a controller and you a little button where you can um, pair it up or reset it and you can remote control your light bulb from with this. So this could be out in your porch or you know somewhere in the house or somewhere out you know, where you can't reach easily uh, and you can remotely enable your light bulb. So those are two two products that they currently have going on their Indiegogo uh, crowdfunding, and I'm going to put a link in the post to that so that you can have a look, um, which 
I will play with. And these both will work up to 240 volts. They're rated from 90 volts to 240 volts. Uh, and th this one is at 2 amps for the light fitting, um, which means that that's basically up to a 500 watt bulb if you're dealing with 240 volts. If you're dealing with 100 volts, of course, that's only about a 200, 250 uh, watt bulb or load. And this one will do up to 10 amps from what it's saying, but we'll have a look inside them and see what they do. Anyway, that's two of the things that came from IT Studio. Um, the other ones that I have in here, which are also interesting, first of all, I'm going to do with the um, the next one, which is a, um, and this was one that I was wanting to look at from an Arduino kind of perspective. And it is a little relay board. Now, you've seen lots of relay boards on um, eBay and stuff like that. And this one is, superficially, it looks no different. All right, you've got the relay on the end here. Um, you've got a little interface for um, telling it to turn on and off. This one's actually a serial interface that you can talk to it. And then you've got a little controller in here. Now, this controller, I'm just going to have a quick look under a microscope because I can't remember exactly what kind it is. Okay, just had a quick look under a microscope. It's an AT Mega 328. So the microcontroller that's on here is the exact same microcontroller that you'll find on an Arduino Uno, an Arduino Leonardo, and things like that. It's the, uh, sorry, not the Leonardo, that's a slightly different one, but the Arduino Uno and compatibles. So it's a full AT Mega 328 microcontroller. It actually has a connection here too that you can put an NRF 24L01 2.4 gigahertz wireless link on it. Um, so you can, you know, by putting this in, with, it, it takes five volts to supply it, and you've got a TTL serial here, and then you've got a relay over this side, which is capable of switching mains, and I'm looking at the PCB, and I, I know you're not going to be able to see it very well in, in this view, but the relay connection is right here, and there are massive, even though there's no cut tracks on this particular board, um, there are massive gaps in the PCB um, isolation between this main side um, and this is the control pins here, these three pins. There is no PCB traces between these three pins here and, and these pins here. So there's a huge gap in this direction and there's quite a huge gap in this area here as well to isolate it. So they've gone to the extra mile to make sure that you've got the clearances that keep this a lot safer. The other nice thing that I see they've done here is they've actually included mounting holes. A lot of boards I see that are available on eBay and places like that don't have mounting holes to be able to put your boards onto anything. So you've got five volts, your relay output is completely isolated from the rest of it because it's a relay and you've got your driver and everything on here. And then you've got a serial interface here that you can actually talk to this. Now, because the board has a full AT Mega 328, it sounds like it's overkill, but it means that you can actually program it to maybe do a timer um, or some other kind of function and um, work autonomously, but then also be able to send it remote control commands. Now, because you can also put in a 2.4, um, gigahertz radio in the form of the NRF 24L01, and I have a bunch of those, so we, we will plug one in and try it. Um, you could set it up as a complete wireless link and have it as a remote controllable. So by coupling this and then a tiny power module, and I'm actually a um, little disappointed that they don't include a mains power module on here as well, um, you can completely remote control this. Now, Having said that about the mains module, though, I do actually have, that they sent me as well, a mains power supply. So this is a tiny, tiny little board. This one's designed to go onto a PCB, so it doesn't actually have mounting holes on it, which is a shame. I'm having difficulty getting that out, but that's what it is. So it's a switching regulator, mains in, it's isolated output, so you, you know, you're, you're not going to be connecting your control systems to mains. And, um, you know, we'll have a look at how well that's built and whether it would meet some of the basic code requirements that you would have for your system. Um, but I'd have to put this on another little piece of board and, and give it some mounting holes to work with that. But by putting this and the relay module into a box that's um, completely enclosed, you could actually build up a little system that's completely wirelessly controlled and perfectly safe. And you can still use your Arduino Uno to control it. It's just going to use the NRF 24L01 um, to actually hook to that. Um, anyway, that's those parts. And then the other bit that IT Studio sent me, which I found was really, really interesting, is in here. And what this is, is they have a range of them, and it's a Nexteon um, LCD display. Now, you're going to say, yeah, well, you've seen lots of LCD displays. 
you know, and they're all, you know, you can get them for a few bucks off of eBay and things like that. And this one is a, a 2.4 inch LCD display, but on the back of it, we've got a full microcontroller and the microcontroller type that's on this one, I will just check this one too, is it's an STM32, so an ST Micro 32 uh, microcontroller on this. And what this does is it completely offloads the um, display handling and touch handling from your application. So if you've ever tried to make a um, pretty much any size LCD, especially color, work with an Arduino Uno or something like that, you'll already know that by the time you've got the LCD libraries in and some touch libraries in, um, you have almost no programming space left to get your program working. You know, because it's all taken up with the libraries. Well, this board has a an SD card slot in it, so you can put a whole bunch of graphics and things like that onto the SD card. But it also has an operating system whereby you can define a whole bunch of buttons and sliders and text boxes and background graphics and all sorts of things like that, and then assign actions to them. So in the past, I've done some videos on things like a Panel Pilot Ace. And when I look at this thing, a Panel Pilot Ace is hundreds of dollars, right? It's quite expensive, but it's industrial. It's designed for going into industrial environments and things like that. This is more designed to go with your Arduino Unos and things. And you could package it up so that you can use it in some kind of commercial application if you wanted to. But it follows the same principle, whereas you design your interface using a graphics design tool, which you can download for free from IT Studio. And you can actually even download it and try it out without even having the LCD display because it has a built-in emulator. Um, and you talk to it through the RS-232. It's a TTL level RS-232 protocol um, port. And you can just send it commands, things like, say, if you labeled one of the text boxes um, status. So you just simply be able to say status.txt equals healthy and it will display healthy on the LCD display. Converse to that, if you've got some buttons defined, you can actually say on press of this button, send this text out the serial port to whatever controller is listening. So you can send out something out to an Arduino Uno or something that says somebody just press the start button and you can make it start some action or an on and an off button or a speed by doing a slider or something. And it would send the relevant values out through the serial port back to the Arduino or whatever you happen to have connected up to it. So we're going to look at hooking this up to an Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, and maybe a launch pad, or even just straight to the PC if you want, um, and see how well it works. But I've already had a little go with this, and I found it to be very, very easy to use these. And you can get these LCD displays. The one I've got is 2.4 inch, um, but you can get them up to 7 inches. Uh, in size. And I've already shown you in previous videos, as I said, the Panel Pilot Ace being an example of uh, bigger displays that have that kind of programming environment. These are um, much, much, much more economical versions of the same things. Now, they don't have a whole case wrapped around them and they're not waterproof and things, but in certain circumstances where you're building something for the home or where you don't need that kind of complexity, maybe a little robot uh, you know, that you're going to have or something, then these things are going to be absolutely ideal. And I suggest that if you want something and you want to be able to have a smaller microcontroller, but you still want to have that fancy graphics display capability, then these might be the kind of thing you're looking for. I'm certainly going to look at these for um, using as status displays for my CNC control. Um, you know, I plan on doing multiple motion control systems over the next sort of uh, year or so, uh, starting off with the CNC controller that I'm building, which is a full one and a half meter by one and a half meter in size with a 15 inch um, Z access. And I'm going to also build some smaller ones that would be used for doing PCB, PCB um, carving and stuff like that. Now, but all of those, you may want to have um, some kind of display that tells you what the coordinates are, what the status is, and all those kind of things. So I want to use things like these, and I'm not sure whether it's going to be this one or some other make or whatever. I've got a lot to choose from right now to be able to do that. So that's something that's well worth looking at. Anyway, that's everything from IT Studio. So we'll move on to the next product. Okay, what's next? Everybody that's been playing with Arduinos and things with Ethernet has probably heard of the WizNet card. So WizNet, they also make um, additional devices. And what I have here is a WizNet, it's an application um, controller. It comes with uh, Ethernet on it. It's an application processor on board. 
And what they've sent me is one that also, and this goes, you know, keeps in line with the whole industrial control with Arduinos and various other things, but it also comes with a daughter card with an RS-485. Now this is what a lot of industrial control systems use for differential drive serial communications between multiple devices. And each, each device would have an ID and you can have, I think, up to 255 strung on one RS-485 loop and you can talk to each other, pass commands and things like that, maybe using a Modbus protocol or something like that. So what we have is the controller board, this one on the top here, they just unplug. That's the controller, that's the WizNet controller itself. Has the um, Ethernet controller on board and it also has an application processor on board. And then this is the RS-485 driver that it just plugs into. So, you know, it's got a few different switches and we'll look into all the functionality of that when it comes time to uh, review this, which won't be long. And uh, I've got one of these to play with, and uh, it's very new from WizNet, so I suggest you check it out if you need that kind of functionality. Anyway, the basic product is a Wiz 550S2E485 daughter board with a, um, the WizNet controller on the top. We will have an investigate of this and have a play with it in uh, a short while. So this is, uh, I'm quite looking forward to this because it's like a complete little controller um, on a board with communication. So, you know, at minimum, if you wanted to have Ethernet to Modbus or something like that, this would fit the bill perfectly because you've got a little controller, you've got Ethernet coming in, you can run your application on here that can listen and translate the commands and then talk at the Modbus to various devices. So there's already, you know, a couple of things I want to try with this, but uh, we'll investigate it more. And WizNet has a whole bunch of new controllers out on their website, and I will link it in um, to this post as well, so you can go and look at all the other new products that they have. It's quite an extensive range. You know, WizNet, I think, in the Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and uh, like little microcontroller world, has become quite well known because of their uh, WizNet 500 um, and things, Ethernet controllers, but they have so much more. So, you know, go check them out, have a look at what they do. And as I say, I'll provide the link and we'll do a video on this in a, in a short while um, to have a look at what it's capable of. Anyway, that's WizNet. So that's the end of that one.